in this time of the church year, really, um, we've come full circle. We celebrated the coming of Jesus at Christmas, his life and ministry through Holy Week, his sufferings, and then his, his death on the cross, the resurrection, uh, the ascension, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Rounded off by Trinity Sunday last week with all the greatness of the Lord. And so the old lectionary, um, which I can understand, um, says this week something about so the beginning of the church, whereas that left us. And I just think that's a good, good passage from uh, 1 Peter 2 um, about so all of those things that God has done for us. In fact, Peter says in his first letter, um, you were born into a living hope. He sort of giving thanks to God the Father for Jesus Christ because of his great mercy. Because of all that the Lord has done for us. In the second chapter, he says, so then, so then. And gives us the fundamentals, gives them and gives us the fundamentals of the church. Great passage. 1 Peter 2, 1. Rid yourselves then of all evil, no more lying or hypocrisy or jealousy or insulting language. Be like the newborn babies, always thirsty for the pure spiritual milk, so that by drinking it you may grow up and be saved. As the scripture says, you have found out for yourselves how kind the Lord is. Come to the Lord, the living stone, rejected by people as worthless, but chosen by God as valuable. Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple, where you will serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. For the scripture says... I chose a valuable stone which I am placing as the cornerstone in Zion, and whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. This stone is of great value for you that believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. As another scripture says, this is the stone that will make people stumble the rock that will make them fall. They stumbled because they did not believe in the word. Such was God's will for them. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God, who called you out of darkness into his own marvellous light. At one time you were not God's people, but now you are his people. At one time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received his mercy. And this picture of um, the church, um, indeed the Christian, as a living stone, living stones built on the foundation of Jesus to be a place of worship, is a fundamental picture which you will know well. But beneath all the sorts of church that we have, this is the fundamentals. Uh, when Peter was writing, it says at the beginning, he's writing to, to all these churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, people all over the Middle East, really, or mainly in what was, we would call Asia, Turkey, uh, and what have you. And these are a mixture of churches. Um, they would have had different traditions. Paul wrote some of them very different letters. We know this. But they are all under pressure. Some of the Christians are quite isolated. And so Peter is writing a basic reminder, not just of the greatness of God and the kindness of Jesus, but actually admits that whether you were a church here or there or there or there, whether you spoke that language, had that tradition, did it this way or that way, what underneath is it you are, what are you called to be because of all that Jesus has done? And we this morning are coming back to you and sharing with you here after my holiday, which seems a long time ago, but it, um, it, whole, in the last fortnight, experiencing churches, well, where have I been? Experienced a, a, an Anglican cathedral with choral evensong, uh, experienced um, big Lutheran churches in Germany with lots of um, big Bibles, 
uh, Roman Catholic uh, cathedrals, big Roman Catholic cathedrals there as well with uh, incense that you could cut with a knife, you know, tr- tremendous stuff. Uh, came across a whole bunch of ch- uh, students in one town being church uh, on a Saturday evening, um, singing and dancing in the square uh, so that they could give witness to Jesus, so that people would come and have a uh, just hear what was going on and find it wasn't just another busker and they would talk to them about Jesus as they did to us. Uh, last week was in Liz's church, Hillsong, big screen, big band, deafening noise, you know? They're all so different. And you know, what do they have in common? What they have in common, says Peter, is that they are like a building built on the foundation of Jesus, of living people, living stones, to be a place of priesthood and worship. Whatever it is, whatever songs you like singing, whatever version of the Bible you like reading, however you do or you do not do your quiet time, whatever you specialise in, whatever you're interested in, as a living stone, as, a, as being built up as a living, pulsating building, this is the fundamentals. It's good to remember that. It's good to remember that as we face a church council, you know, with all those bits and pieces and AGM and what we like about that and the property and the money and the electrics and the colour of this and the this and that. You know, what is it underneath it all that we are called to be living stones built up on the foundation of Jesus? Now, I think this is a great picture. Most Most of this passage actually is about Jesus. It's about the living stone, which is the foundation. And we are called as individuals to live with a foundation of Jesus. You might say, well, that's, that's, that's fairly common to God. We don't even know that. But we do because uh, again and again, you know it. I know it that this is the rock on which I will build. And yet, I, it, it, ipso facto, I didn't do that. I mean, this morning, what is it that each of you is primarily confident in? What do you rest on, Really? I mean, it could be your health. It could be your pension. It could be your family and supportive relationships. It could be your job and the way you occupy your time. It could be your church. It could be all sorts of things. Some of those are quite good. But the Bible tells us that fundamentally, our foundation is in Jesus. Jesus says, doesn't he, um, about the man building his house on a rock. You you build your house on a rock if you hear my words and do them. It's almost as though Peter wants to go further and says, yeah, we want to build ourselves on what Jesus says and to do it. But actually, I want to build my life on Jesus himself. It's just a little step beyond that even. Foundation is all. Foundation for the church, foundation, whatever. We were staying in a, a, a German village for some time. And they were building a new house there. Uh, we prepared for that because we used to live there. But it's quite extraordinary business when the Germans build a new house. There, there's the usual fence and a, uh, and a crane and all that sort of stuff for building it. But rather than building the house, they dig a massive great hole in the ground. In fact, this hole was big enough to take a complete bulldozer. And uh, you think, this is going in the wrong direction, really. We <laughs> should be building a house, not digging for oil. But it's just this huge hole. And what they will then do is fill the bottom with concrete and then they will build a a great sort of solid structure coming back to the surface, which becomes ultimately the basement. And then they fill it in and then they build a house on top of it. I think that's a really good picture that we have from here about building on the rock of Jesus, on the foundations of Jesus and putting your efforts into the foundations, you know. You want to live in a prefab, you can live in a prefab, you know, it's, it's okay. But what about the foundations? And you think sometimes, I'm, I'm resting on Jesus, but that's not getting me anywhere. You just rest on Jesus, it will get you somewhere. You can build this week on Jesus. Uh, when it gets to our, our, our thinking about how our church works and lives next week on Maisie Day, it is to be built on Jesus. It's not built on a music band out the front. It's not built on cheap sandwiches it's not built on good coffee it's built on jesus you know there is in the foundation 
And there is where we put a lot of our effort, and Peter, you feel Peter is saying, what the effort there? In the foundations, in the rocket. And then this business about being built up on it by Jesus as living stones. Now, I don't know about you, but living stones does not immediately work for me. Um, it's an interesting metaphor, isn't it, living stone? We were, as you do normally when coming down to 303, um, stuck in a traffic jam by um, Stonehenge, you know? And those of you, stand, it's that little bit when you're coming down, uh, the road goes down, and there it is, isn't it? It's the, the, the fields and there's Stonehenge, with all those ants walking around it. This is good, isn't it, you know? Uh, and, and, and you think, oh. I'm thinking, there is absolutely no possibility of confusing the people with the rocks, is there? You know? That is a rock, that is Stonehenge, and they are the people walking around. I mean, it would be pretty nuts if the people were stood in the middle like this and the rocks were walking around. It's nuts, Alice, it doesn't happen. How do you have a living stone? A stone is by far the least living thing we know. And yet, Peter wants to say, look, what, what, what Jesus wants you to be is solid and alive. <laughs> solid and alive. We talk about the solidity of, of, of discipleship, of what Jesus makes us to be strong and firm and yet to be full of spiritual life. So often we're one or the other. I'm just plodding along, I'm doing it, I'm keeping the rules, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Mm. You know? But sometimes after Pentecost you get the feeling that being a Christian and being filled with the Spirit is just a matter of how you feel. It's just about singing in tongues, or, which is great actually. But all that kind of thing but without solidity, without discipline, without holiness, it's just air. I want you to be a living stone, not a living nothing or just a stony stone. You know, it needs to be put together so that we can be built together. And he says, I will build you up. That's good to be built up. You're feeling this morning more stone than living. Some of you might be a bit more bouncy or feeling more living than stone. But it needs to be both, you see. To be built up by him. Because he's doing the building. He builds them up. And then he says, finally, I just want to encourage you with this picture, Richie, which you all know, but I just think it's so good. So that he says, um, so that um, it will be a spiritual temple to serve, so you can serve as holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifice to God through Jesus Christ. King's priests, a holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God. I find this very relaxing, very releasing. What is it we're supposed to be? We're supposed to be priests. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be worshipping. There's so many things to do in the church. My job, I'm supposed to be a chief executive, leader, manager, teacher, preacher, visitor, taker of blame. All, all, those, you know, all those things you do, this is right, I'm not knocking that, but it's a great thing. And what am I? I'm supposed to be a priest. Some of you, what are you doing? You're in a band, or you're on the flower rotor, you make the coffee, or you run a home group, or, or you help with the sound, or you do all sorts of stuff. What are you called to be? You're all called to be priests that stand before God. So this building is supposed to be like that. It's not a social centre. It's not public space. You know, it's not a teaching place, just. It's certainly not a heritage event. It's a place of worship. That's, I said it. Is sim he simplifies it down. The foundation of Jesus, built of living stones and for worship. Isn't that a great thing to think? That's what, he's been. what am I supposed to be doing here? Hmm. Okay, let's do something different. Let's all stand a moment, shall we? Let's just bow our heads. Father, we, we thank you for this great biblical picture that you give us. We come as busy people and we have a busy view of being Christians. And we have a busy view of church. And we have our own ideas about how we should do this and this and this. Lord, I pray this morning that we should put our feet on a firm foundation. As individuals and as a church, we should be builded upon Jesus. What he says, what he does and who he is. And we pray that we should be built up as living stones fitted together to be a pulsating body which is a place of worship a place of the kingdom a place where your glory falls upon the earth and from which the kingdom grows we ask this for your precious name's sake amen, amen. please sit down yeah.
Now, I just want to finish then by... You thought that was a really short sermon. Um, <laughs> yeah. Actually, I thought if it wasn't going well, I could have finished there. But actually, so... But we will just go on a bit. Because, you know, I find the living stones business not just a difficult metaphor, but a difficult thing to do. I am instinctively concrete. And I, I, I don't find this living stones business being easy, and I don't find it. But this passage... This passage, just be very brief, has it within itself ways of doing this. It's no good just saying, oh, I'd love to be living stones and built on a pie. No, it says that. It says first of three things. One to get rid of, things to get rid of, things to take on board, and things to let go of. It's all good. First of all, it says, to, things to get rid of is a repentance. Rid yourselves then of all evil, no more lying, hypocrisy or jealousy or insulting language. Oh, you say, no, I, don't, I want to be inspired at is come back to repentance. But actually, we're supposed to be a holy nation, so you're going to need to be holy. And what, it, what, it, what, what Peter says here, rid yourselves, is the same Greek as St. Paul uses for take off. When they were baptised in those days, it must have been an exciting time. They took off all, and I say all, all their clothes. Um, and uh, then they went, went baptised in the water, came out and put on new clothes. That's the Greek. All right? Take off. Take off, repent, you know, so you're released from this. Do not think, oh, I can't get it off, it's just me. It's not. It's not like one of these painful things where sometimes after an operation, somebody needs a piece of skin taken off of their thigh so as to mend another bit up. It's very painful because it's a bit of them. But your clothes aren't a bit of you. They do come off and take off this sin so you can be living, so you can't be constrained, so you can be free, so you're not bouncy, you know. Uh, in, in the previous, uh, previous chapter, uh, Peter looks at it slightly differently in 14, 1, 4. Do not allow your lives to be shaped by those desires you had when you were still ignorant. Sin shapes you. And if you take it off, then you can become the living shape that Jesus wants you to be. I've got a feeling that many of the problems we have in a church situation, in an interpersonal situation, in a group situation, is that we are the wrong shape. So we don't fit. We have odd angles. You know that sin produces odd angles and sharp points, doesn't it? But in fact, if we are loosened up, this is a great sense. Uh, I've been to see my uh, uh, new uh, granddaughter, Nova, last weekend. I've had a good look at her, actually, and I, I'm unbiased, but I just think that she probably is the finest. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I see a lot of babies, but um, anyway, that, anyway, that's by the way. But I, I'm, she's not quite there yet, but I know with my daughters, it's a great thing when you took all their kit off and let them just roll around on a, on a, on a sheet or a blanket or something like this, you know. No nappy, no nappy. That must be a great thought. You know what a nappy, uh, holding your legs together, and you've got all this baby grow thing, which makes you feel as though you don't want to grow because it's all elastic sort of thing. And then a pullover and all those things that people dress you up with. Uh, and then you, you're, in a, you know, you're stuck in this sort of... Um, uh, Moses basket so you can't roll around you take it all off oh, it's just me. that's a great picture you know rid yourselves then if you want to be living stones you can be shaped up by Jesus why what do you want all this stuff on for I remember years ago when I used to trek a lot and we used, would walk with a whole day with a rucksack on oh, it's not hugely heavy perhaps perhaps 40 pounds or something like that it was heavier before metrication but it, it you know and I, I remember walking all day and it's strapped round your scene, strapped like this. Hard men. And all At the end of the day, you took the rucksack off, and you were no longer constrained by the straps and the belts. Oh, but what was extraordinary, and you, some of you may have experienced this, if you walked all day with 40 pounds on your back, when you take a few next steps, you bounce. You go, it's amazing, I don't have it on anymore. That is a great picture. Rid yourselves if you want to be living stones. Rid yourselves if you want to be a, a living stones of a church. So that you bounce. That's great. Repentance. Get rid of some of this stuff. You aren't a living stone. You aren't being built up. Why? Well, because we're not holy. We need to be holy. It's no good just having vision and plans and ideas unless we are holy. The Methodist Church needs to learn that as well. And then it says you need to take on some stuff. Back to my granddaughter. 
Be like newborn babies, always thirsty for the pure spiritual milk. What a noise. What a noise with this milk business. You know, I won't do it on here. But. It's a great picture. The, the commentary goes on about allusions to um, uh, taste and see that the Lord is good and all that sort of thing in the Old Testament. I'm sure that's all true. But in those societies, they had lots of babies and they were much the same as today. They made a lot of noise. It's a great picture. It's very focused. I want my milk. He says, you need to be, if you are a living stone, like a living baby, you need to be taking this stuff on. There's no good saying, I want to be living, but I'm not taking it on. You know, the energy comes from there, from the Lord. He says, from spiritual things, he says. As, the, as he says, um, grow, uh, drinking it, you may grow up and be saved. Pure spiritual milk, your input. You need an enthusiasm for it. She has an enthusiasm for this milk, you know. Hum, you know, it's there. It's not walking through the supermarket. Oh, I don't want to buy that. Oh, I had that last week and I'm not very really interested in that. Is that on offer? It's not that at all, is it? So often with my spirituality, I'm like that. Oh, I don't want to read that. I don't want to show that. I'm a bit tired. Wow, let's get to it, you know. You say, you're going to be a living stone if you're all for it. And not only that, but she knows where it's coming from. It's no good saying when she's hungry, you want your teddy bear? I want my milk. You know, his grandpa. I want my milk. We have diversified in truth. We have diversified in truth. We want to know where the truth comes from. It comes from the spirit of the Lord. Hmm? And we need to be. You say, well, okay, that's just taking me back from being a living stone to be enthusiastic. I'm not very living stone because I'm not very enthusiastic. But then the key says. It says here, as the scripture says, you have found out for yourselves how kind the Lord is. There's a real witness here to what has happened before. You may have an instinct for this milk, but you've learned where it is. Thanksgiving is a great start for enthusiasm. You know? I used to sing a song, was it? Count your blessings, name them one by one, and you will find what the Lord has done. And thanksgiving as to what the Lord has done is a great sort of starter. It's a great starter. Why would he let me down now? Why would he not do this? Why would I do Why am I not going to mother? Because there's always been milk there before. You know, taste and see that the Lord is good. I remember he was good. That's why new Christians are so keen on the Bible and on prayer. Because they are aware of the kindness of the Lord and we lose that edge. So this week, perhaps, we can take on more, have with more enthusiasm. You could be thinking, oh, well, I do more. Why? Because I am confident what he's done. Final thing, we should finish. Final thing, I've said what a great thing it is that the Lord is building the house. Building you and building you together. What a great thing that is. But it's a great thing to celebrate that after Pentecost, he doesn't say, I've done my part now it's time for the church and the Christians to do their part. He does not subcontract out. Sometimes on a big building site, a company will come in and what's, do what's called groundworks. Then somebody else comes in and builds the building. You could feel that with, the, with all that Jesus' is work in the incarnation, Christmas, Easter, and, uh, and everything is complete. Now over to you. I've done the groundworks. Now you build the building. Sometimes the church feels like that, doesn't it? You know, we've got the plans here, and now he's left it to us. But no, it's the Lord's house. He has laid the foundations, and he continues to build it. That's why as living stones we are made together. He fits us together. Each one of us is equipped and moulded. But I just want to say this to finish with. This is a downside, which we find difficult. Let yourselves be built up. That's a tough phrase. We are activists. We like to do stuff for the Lord but what about let yourselves be built up that's not a passive but it is receptive it doesn't mean you don't do anything but it means that we need to stop building for him our efforts our foundations our ideas my spirituality my quiet time my bible reading my home groups my church my services my sermons my everything and I built the whole building and stuck a cross on the top and said Lord that's yours he said it doesn't look like mine let yourself be built. If you want to be a living stone, you need to be built up by the Lord. If we want to be fit together as living stones, he does that. You see, that's a bit mystical, Alistair. 
It means something like that when we've, when we've got together on a Thursday, we put the songs together with the band. We come here and we, we do some worship. But we want to be formed by the worship. Not the worship to be formed by us. You may go and have a time of prayer. and You've got a, a prayer that's a good thing for people to pray for. You formed it. But in your prayer time, allow your prayer time to form you. You may have decided you're reading the Bible uh, in an organized way, which is really good. But as you go to the Bible and you begin to read it, let the passage and how long you read it and which bits you read twice, let the word speak to you so that it forms you. And if you've got a home group and you've got, oh, what we're going to do this week is we're going to do this, isn't it? And as it develops, let the Lord form the group. And let now, as we come to communion, say, oh, we know what we do, we queue up and we have the bread and the wine. Yeah, I know. But let that form you. Let it form your conversations this week. So that you are built up and I am built up. And every time you think, oh, I think I'll branch out with a new idea. No. Be formed. Be remade. So let us just quietly this week think on this in all our busyness to be a living stone on a foundation of Jesus. To be a priest who above all worships and is in touch with the Lord. To let off, to take off all the sin that holds us down so that we are neither lively or the right shape. <laughs> to take on that pure spiritual milk like a baby, you know, infused by having found that God has a great track record. He didn't let you down before, he won't let you down now. You know? And in all that activity, to retain a sense of being on the receiving end, that this is the Lord, this is the Lord's house. I am the Lord's house. And if it's the Lord's, let him build it and build within me and build with me.